Hello everybody and welcome to my review of Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, which is the second part of this Barbenheimer weekend. If you didn't see my review for Barbie earlier, you can check the little thing up there in the corner and watch that one or check the videos that I've uploaded here on the channel. This has been a very exciting week for moviegoers and for film fans because as much as people talked in the early days about how crazy it was that these two movies were going to be going against each other, it really has kind of turned into this very unique social cultural event and I think it's because these movies are so different and this is a very different movie from Barbie for the people that are doing the double feature back to back I, I, I really the whiplash from these two movies has got to be pretty insane Oppenheimer is written and directed as I mentioned by Christopher Nolan and tells the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer known as the father of the atomic bomb this invention was the turning point of the 20th century and may still well play a part in our own self-destruction and this is not a simple story story to tell, which makes sense then to have Christopher Nolan be the one in the director's chair because his films have increased in complexity as his career has gone on. After a falling out with Warner Brothers, this is also Christopher Nolan's first film with Universal Pictures, which is owned by Comcast, a company that generated free cash flow of $12.6 billion in 2022, but claims that it's too expensive to compensate their actors and writers. One of the things that has dogged my early critical career is that post-Inception, I've actually had issues with every single Christopher Nolan film, and I've never been as enthusiastic about them as so many of my peers and people just in the movie-going public have been. The Dark Knight Rises was epic but messy. Interstellar had mind-blowing spectacle but some pretty serious story issues. Dunkirk was undercut by the decision to play with the order of time and the ordering of the scenes. And Tenet was an ambitious movie that just got too mixed up in the mechanics of its own story. As it turns out though, it feels like all of these movies were just bringing us to this movie in Christopher Nolan's career, that he was basically sharpening the tools that he would need to make Oppenheimer. And Christopher Nolan here delivers a movie of both impossible scale and uncomfortable intimacy. I think it is the sum total of his career so far. Or to riff on a phrase from Christopher Nolan's version of Batman, which helped to launch his career as a blockbuster director, Nolan's previous films weren't flawed masterpieces. They were just practice. Oppenheimer is three hours long, packed with five hours worth of cinematic experience, and much like the chain reaction that provides the explosive power of the atom bomb, once it starts, this movie cannot be stopped, as we follow J. Robert Oppenheimer's journey from ambitious quantum physicist to destroyer of worlds from all angles. The movie is telling one story, but it is jumping back and forth in time from before the bomb test to while the bomb is being developed to after the bomb test to see what happens it is the temporal pincer maneuver of biopics, but unlike, in my opinion, his use of time in other movies, this time it actually works. Killian Murphy turns in the performance of his career as Oppenheimer, whose own ambition and genius may have become mankind's bane, if not his own. By the time Oppenheimer reaches his Ian Malcolm moment of starting to think about whether they should be inventing the bomb, the wheels are already in motion. You cannot stop what's already happening. First, there's a war to be won, and then the United States has to stay ahead of the Soviets and Russia. And this device that I believe Oppenheimer earnestly believed would deliver a lasting peace to the world because of its its awful power instead pushes us further to the brink of destruction than we've ever been before. Killian Murphy embodies this man, this haunted man, so beautifully, and in my opinion, he won't just be attending the Academy Awards whenever they're held next year or whenever the strike ends. I think he may well be walking up on stage to accept his own. Speaking of the Academy Awards, the sheer number of Oscar-nominated and Oscar-winning actors in this movie is insane. There's somebody that you recognize in nearly every scene, and there are even some recent Oscar winners that show up for like a scene or two. To name a few, Matt Damon plays a crucial role as General Groves, the government head of Oppenheimer's Manhattan Project, whose interests in protecting Oppenheimer and protecting national security often conflict. Emily Blunt plays Oppenheimer's wife, Kitty, who has a complicated relationship with her husband, but emerges as one of his fiercest defenders. The second half of this film, in particular, Blunt is great. 
great. And Robert Downey Jr. plays Louis Strauss, head of the Atomic Energy Commission, whose relationship with Oppenheimer is an alliance that's fraught with simmering resentments. We know that Robert Downey Jr. is a great actor. That's how he established himself all those years ago, but he's been so caught up for the last 15 years or so with mostly Iron Man and Sherlock Holmes projects that it's easy to forget just how much he can slip into the role as a dramatic actor, and he is so good in this movie. I think that he may perhaps be a leading contender for Best Supporting Actor this year, along with Killian Murphy, and I think also along with Emily Blunt in her role. The number of recognizable faces climbs up into the dozens, but others that make impacts include Benny Softy as Edward Teller, proponent and inventor of the hydrogen bomb, Florence Pugh as Gene Tatlock, a love interest of Oppenheimer's whose associations prove difficult for him, and Tom Conti as Albert Einstein, perhaps one of the only people alive who can understand the burden of Oppenheimer's knowledge and also the fame that comes with it. As you could expect from a Nolan movie, Oppenheimer is just like injectable cinema. This is the kind of movie that Christopher Nolan makes, the kind of movies that can only exist initially on the big screen where this movie, by the way, should be seen. It uses every tool in existence and even some that weren't. Reportedly, they invented black and white IMAX film for this movie specifically. Oppenheimer is a visceral engagement of the senses, not just for the infamous Trinity test, but also for the events before and after. The intensity of J. Robert Oppenheimer's life was not just limited to that one day when he conducted the first atomic bomb test. There's one crucial scene and haunting scene, and I use that word a lot in connection with this movie because it is oftentimes a haunting movie, and it's as good a depiction as I've seen where you see what a character is thinking and how the director expresses it, and all also just making the audience feel the anxiousness and the nervousness and the dread. Much like the actual atomic bomb, the danger of this film isn't just the blast, but the fallout. And this movie covers a lot of ground. Nolan grabs you by the collar and throws you into these events for three hours. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that I walked out of the theater exhausted and actually went home and immediately just laid down and took a nap. This is an extremely talky three-hour film, largely about the existential weight of looming scientific achievement that also delves deeply into the moral complexities of destroying lives to save lives and the dark truths of the U.S. government and its tendency to manipulate and use people until they're no longer useful, at which point they become liabilities. In other words, this isn't just a movie about a big bomb that goes boom. That may be what some people are expecting, but I think that Christopher Nolan delivers something infinitely more interesting than that, and it is one of the most singular experiences as far as watching a movie that I've had in a really, really long time. On balance, given its ambitions and how successfully it achieves those ambitions, I think this may be Christopher Nolan's best film. And if it's not, then it is right up there with his best movies. There were a few small issues that held me back slightly, as has kind of become customary with Nolan's film. I think that the sound mix drowns out the dialogue in certain scenes, although not to the degree that we saw with Tenet. There are also a lot of characters in this movie, and they all talk very fast, and they talk a lot. We're jumping around in time. Sometimes Nolan will sort of remind you who that person is, but there's not a lot of hand-holding with the movie. At one point, there's a group of characters that are talking about the development of the bomb in Germany, and they start talking about graphite moderators and why that's so exciting. Exciting. And it was at that moment that I was very glad that I'm engaged to a nuclear scientist because she, in talking about Chernobyl and all these other things, told me about graphite moderators. So I understood why people in this movie were excited by that news. However, I also understand that not everybody is fortunate enough to be engaged to a nuclear scientist. Although if you're not, I would highly recommend it. I talked about the ambitions of this film and how successfully Christopher Nolan delivers on those ambitions, and that's actually a word that's kind of been echoing around in my head as I've processed this movie and tried to figure out what I want to say, and these are very long-winded thoughts, but that word, ambition, and I think that that's largely something that's been missing from so many movies, and especially movies this summer, because thinking back so far, even movies that I liked... I think that most of them lacked ambition. I can see the reality where the more boring version of these two movies were the ones that were hitting theater this weekend. We could get the version of Barbie that was basically an inoffensive riff on the Lego movie, a fish out of water romp. And I could see this version of Oppenheimer, which is about a scientific triumph, a glowing portrait of the scientific genius J. Robert Oppenheimer with the obligatory final scene that hints at the grave consequences of what comes later, but really just follows it by text on screen affirming his genius. 
Instead, these films are made by writer-directors in Greta Gerwig and Christopher Nolan that wanted to do more, that wanted to push past what people would expect from these films and deliver something truly unique to them as filmmakers. When it comes to Barbie, you know, if you've seen my review, there were some things in the movie that didn't work as much for me as it has worked for other people, but I also think that the movie is very ambitious in its goals and aims, and the production of that movie in particular is so great. It was such a delight just to watch that film. And Oppenheimer, which is now easily my favorite film of the year, rejects the celebration of American ingenuity angle to tell a far darker and more complex story that transcends international boundaries and global conflicts to show you the darkness of man's soul and the depths that never before imagined power will drive people to. It is perhaps the most, and I'm going to use this word one more time, haunting quote unquote summer blockbuster since Steven Spielberg brought a Saving Private Ryan 25 years ago. And yet, even though these movies movies don't really deliver what would be the more audience-pleasing option, according to many studio executives. It also seems like they're both poised for success. It appears that Barbie is going to have a massive opening weekend, maybe the best opening weekend of the summer, and it also looks like Oppenheimer is going to perform well this weekend. I can tell you that here in my market, the 5 p.m. Thursday screenings, which are usually the, the preview screenings, the first time that you can see one of these big movies, are rarely well attended. I can't tell you how many big movies this summer I've gone to the five o'clock screening and it has played to mostly empty seats. When I went to see the 5 p.m. Thursday screening of Oppenheimer, nearly every single seat in the movie theater that I was in was filled. So sitting in this full theater for this dark three hour time jumping drama, while also experiencing sitting in these empty theaters for what everybody thought people were gonna to flock to tells me that maybe studios are underestimating the audience desire for something new, unique, and complex, something ambitious, something that will challenge them. Maybe studios shouldn't be afraid to take risks. Maybe they've underestimated the intelligence of the average moviegoer. Maybe they need to empower filmmakers to make their own visions, not some focus group's vision. And by the way, empowering these creatives to execute their vision also means paying them what they're worth. Warner Brothers lost Christopher Nolan because they undervalued him and took him for granted. And now it seems like all of the other studios are risking losing an entire entertainment industry for that exact same reason. At the height of the summer movie season, an openly feminist movie about a 64-year-old toy and a darkly introspective non-linear biopic about a nuclear physicist will likely deliver the best box office weekend of the year so far. And if that doesn't prove the value of experimentation, then I don't know what does. So even though it doesn't need to be said after this gush session about this movie, yes, I say see it now for Oppenheimer. It is my highest possible recommendation. The only people I would say maybe shouldn't go see it are the ones that probably know that a three-hour drama about the father of the atomic bomb wouldn't be for them anyway. Other than that, this is some of the best filmmaking that you're going to see right now. And this whole weekend really features some incredible filmmaking. This Barbenheimer double feature, like I said, it would be a bit of a shock going from one to the other, but how great to see two films this refreshing, sharing the marketplace and seemingly not boxing each other out. It looks like there's plenty of success to go around, again, proving this thing that, hey, it turns out audiences might actually like good movies. It's crazy how this works. You don't have to be a math or a physics genius sometimes to figure these things out. Thank you so much for watching my review of Oppenheimer and stay tuned right here on the channel for more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. I cannot wait to see what the box office is for these two movies and talk about it on charts next week. Thank you so much for spending part of your day here with me. Until next time, stay safe and I'll see you then. Bye.